So welcome back to the final session of today's festival. Um, we are being joined by Danielle Monti, who is Director, Brand and Packaging Design, Consumables Private Brands at Amazon USA. He has transformed brands like Starbucks and Tazo, and more recently, a portfolio of more than a dozen private brands owned by Amazon. He is a current Pencil Jewelry member, an avid drum player, and a super cool guy. Following Danielle's presentation, we'll be asking your questions, so please type them in the Q&A box below. You can ask your questions at any time, and they can be upvoted at the end, and we will ask you the best questions, so make sure you get involved. Post on social media using at Pentwoods or hashtag Pentwoods Festival. This is our last session of today, so please give a warm welcome for the one and only Danielle Monti. Hello, <laughs> my friend. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I, Adam, I, I, I thought you were going to say at the end of the presentation, I'm going to do a drum solo, which I would have absolutely <laughs> refused to do. But um, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, like Adam said, my name is Daniele Monti, and uh, I lead brand design with Consumables Private Brands at Amazon here in rainy Seattle. Um, let me just start with a preamble here. I, I've done this several times before. I've never done it this way. I wish you could see my, my setup here. I have two computers, uh, three screen, two mice, uh, one trackpad, only two hands. So please bear with me uh, if I run into some technical glitches and awkwardness. I will try to run this as smoothly as possible. Um, I think I'm gonna just get, just gonna put this into the, the bucket of the 2020 new experiences that I've never had before. And God knows if we all had a, a fair show of those uh, this year. Um, it has been a hell of a year. Uh, uh, for the last three months, like many of you, I've been working remotely, been working from, from my studio here at home. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that at first gave me all kinds of anxiety and all kinds of uh, preoccupation, um, all kinds of disastrous predictions in my head about missing deadlines and the Wi-Fi connection that would crash all the time. I was concerned about um, our design work now making a good, a good impression on screen and that frankly that it would have been a mess. Um, but then we're, we're now, you know, six months, seven months into this and uh, slowly day after day, week after week, um, really I started to realize that things were, were working fine. Uh, you know, deadlines were not, were not missed. And in many instances, uh, I have to say that I have observed sort of a new found focus of, of some kind, a new commitment, uh, precisions, precision in actions and the language and uh, a, real, a real overall efficiency that, that truly surprised me. So things are fine. Uh, things are working the way they should. And uh, uh, the, the one thing that, I, that I'm observing though is that th that is a problem, uh, ironically. The fact that remote, uh, remote work remotely works is, uh, is something that can be sustained for a long period of time. And that is a problem uh, in my view because under the surface, uh, I think that is reducing all of the interaction, at least the interaction within, within the creative uh, community and probably more personally within the, my creative team um, to very functional conversations. We don't bounce off ideas uh, the way that, uh, that we used to. We, we don't inspire each other the same way that we used to. And uh, I do feel that in the long run, this may really dry us out a little bit. And really my hope is that we can reverse this uh, sometime soon. Um, it's obviously, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a very common situation. School isn't much different. I have a daughter who is a college student at Parsons in New York City. And she was telling me the other day that during a Zoom class, because that's apparently what they're called nowadays, um, there was a, a friend of her that was so understimulated that he started covering in glitter glue an entire plate that he, has in, he had in front of him. And all he cared about was to guess how long the glue would have taken to dry. So how was that for boredom? Anyway, um, the, the, uh, 
the, so the, the, the normal, the normal uh, 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 work very capable creatives uh, on my team. Uh, of course, this time I had to do it, um, I had to do it in a vacuum, uh, which is definitely not my preference. But like many of you, I have uh, tons of material, many books on visual design compendiums and, um, you know, my own, my own work, uh, 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 mood boards, uh, sketchbooks, all kinds of stuff that I have collected over the years and that it's normally my source of inspiration when I start a new project, especially at the research phase. And um, this time though, there was something different. This time I had this kind of unsettling feeling that started to really grow on me, a feeling of really finding those images that I certainly have once revered and admired and I found very inspiring, I actually started to find them a little uninteresting, almost almost flat in some ways and prescribed. And um, really started to see much of the work that is out there, including my own, by the way, I'm not here to criticize uh, other, <laughs> other people's work, but um, uh, instead of being really the, the, uh, the product of a creative expression, uh, that was uh, with the intent of um, uh, bringing to, up to surface the trait of uh, of uh, uh, the brands uh, that are that are the objective of the project. Uh, really started to look like a, a very well executed visual recipe of some kind, almost like a, 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 an effort, a calculated effort to fit into a certain type of aesthetic um, and kind of fitting into the box of what good design is considered to be. Um, I don't know why this, this creative isolation is having this deep effect on me, but I really, it started to underline for me how important it is to um, keep the, the, the purpose of our, of our job uh, front and center all the time. And really never lose an edge, never lose a uh, different perspective and, and maybe also a little bit of fun, which, which never hurts. Um, and so that really brought me to the point that I started to feel the need to um, uh, sort of unshuckle from what I call the, the, the governing laws of, of normal design. Uh, and as a consequence of that, uh, I really started to challenge uh, some of the sacred cows of brand design. So what I want to do today is to share with you some of these thoughts, some of these observations. I'm not here to teach. I'm not here to criticize other people's work. I'm not here to pontificate. There's plenty of great presentations that are done by very capable professionals all over the internet on similar topics and probably much more in depth than, than, than this one. Um, what I'm here to do today is to tell you about my journey uh, as a creative and hopefully inspire myself and, and you, excuse me, uh, in order to maybe approach future projects uh, a little differently. Um, so let's see here. So, so, so some, of the, some of the most prominent dogmas around brand design uh, revolve around concepts like uh, the importance of consistency, uh, typographic style, color appropriateness. Um, for those of you like myself that work extensively in the food and beverage industry, the concept of appetite appeal, something that we hear all the time, there's not enough appetite appeal, uh, and so on. And, and these pillars aren't necessarily wrong per se, but I started to feel like over the course of time, they almost took a life <clears throat> of their own to the point that anything that doesn't follow a certain style rather than expressing the brand for what it truly is, feels somewhat not right, not normal, and oftentimes dismissed. Um, one of the most common side effects of what I'm talking about is that we often see brands that look incredibly similar uh, in their visual expression. Again, I'm not, I'm not here to talk too, in, too deep into, into this, uh, 
Uh, again, there's many, many good examples out there, but I, I, would rather, I would rather focus on the opposite and share with you some thoughts and observation around designer that actually did not do that. Um, I think it's fair to say that at its core, the mission of a brand designer is, uh, is certainly ambitious, but also extremely clear. Uh, so I'm going to try to summarize that. And so I would say that through the use of visual and verbal cues, um, we associate or we try to associate a certain tone and manner to products and hopefully trigger an emotional reaction in the viewer. Ultimately, we want people to buy products. At least that's my job. But uh, it, it starts with an emotional reaction. So it's as simple as that. Um, I remember in my, my first year in our, in our school, uh, which is about 125 years ago, um, we spent a big part of the first semester on a study that, uh, for some reason, started to come back uh, in my mind in the last few weeks. And it's a study that, at the time, I did not take too seriously, to be honest with you. In fact, I thought that it was quite silly and maybe also a little bit of a waste of time. I'm gonna explain what that is, and some of you can probably relate to this. The assignment was, was very simple. It was, it, was, it was about to take a single word, which oftentimes was an adjective, and we had to uh, express it or visually depict it in two different ways. Uh, the first one, uh, uh, aiming at depicting the word uh, in order to reinforce the meaning of, of, of the word itself. And the second one was to do exactly the opposite. So, so let me try to share my screen um, and try to explain what I mean by this. Uh, bear with me for a second. Okay, I think it's working. All right, so if I show you the word thin and, and I choose this typographic style, uh, obviously, the look and feel of, of, the, of the latter form is helping convey the message of thin. But if I show you the same word with a very heavy, uh, heavyweight font, uh, obviously this is creating some headwind in order for me to, try to telegraph the meaning of the word itself. This is super simple and there's, 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 there's more. The word fast, if I, again, if I create a visual expression of the word fast so that I imply a movement from left to right, at least for us in the Western culture, from left to right, uh, obviously I'm reinforcing this idea. Uh, if I take the same identical word and I inscript the letters into heavy blocks, uh, then all of a sudden that meaning is not, is not so logical, it's not so immediate. Uh, and the examples can go on. The word open, when you, you know, in this case, we have the current that has been tracked uh, uh, considerably. And um, uh, the opposite of that would be uh, something that it's actually closing the space between the letters. And all of a sudden, you have something that uh, doesn't work as well anymore. The word heavy, uh, uh, kind of, kind of uh, uh, precip precipitating to the, to, the, to the bottom of the page here. And then the same word uh, in this sort of, you know, levitating um, through the um, uh, through the page. So um, again, a, a very very simple, um, very simple exercise. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to go back to the original screen. No. Uh, okay. All right, I think I'm back. Um, but the part that is really amazing here is that uh, the intent of the exercise is so simple and so basic that it's astonishing to me how many times it's forgotten. Um, I know that I'm guilty of that. And, but the, despite the straightforwardness of, the, uh, of what I just share with you, in my view, this super silly study is the very cradle of visual communication and something that we should always keep in mind regardless of the complexity of the problem that is in front of us. Um, and so just like industrial design is driven by 
the function of the object being designed, so you design a chair to sit, you design a spoon to eat soup, you design a remote control to manage the functions of a, of a, of a device, TV, whatever. Um, graphic design should always be driven by the feeling that it wants to provoke, by the emotional reaction that it's trying to trigger. And, um, and I think that when this very simple purpose is subjugated to fitting into a specific visual aesthetic, I'm afraid that we have already failed as visual communicators because we're, we're, we're making the second more important than the first. Um, so I mentioned before the dogmas of, uh, of normal uh, brand design and um, uh, how they really started to feel a little less stable in, 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 in my view. Uh, uh, and I wanted to spend a few minutes to talk about this because it's, it's an interesting, interesting part of this, of this whole topic. Um, when I started to think about the role of visual communication and more specifically the role of brand design and at the same time making um, a conscious effort to free myself from those uh, kind of universally accepted guidelines, um, some of my convictions really started to vacillate and, and brought me to think that sometimes not always, of course, but sometimes uh, our creativity trips in a bunch of BS that I, I'm afraid that we have passively accepted. Again, I'm not generalizing here. I'm, I'm, and it's mostly a reflection about myself, so I know that I have been guilty of that. I don't know if you can relate to this. Um, but let me show you, let me show you a few examples here. Let's, let's take, for instance, the concept of consistency. And this is one that has been inculcated in my brain basically since the day I stepped foot in this industry. Consistency is key. If you change things too much, consumers won't understand you, won't find your products. Consistency is the lifeblood of brand equity, et cetera, et cetera. But is it, are we absolutely sure that that is the case? Uh, like one, for example, uh, if consistency is expressed through, through its opposite, which is inconsistency. What if the only thing that is consistent in a brand design system is actually change? Um, let me share my screen again, uh, and let me show you, uh, let me show you Anna Sui. Anna Sui is a uh, fashion designer um, that decided to uh, create uh, the brand identity for her company is actually something that changes constantly all the time and uh i don't know the behind the scene here but i believe that is the reason why it's because as a fashion designer she doesn't want to be associated to a certain style and therefore she created this sort of blank canvas that uh is uh, a great opportunity for many illustrator graphic designers collaborators you name it that every single time create a new, some sort of a new incarnation of her brand identity. And uh, there's nothing here that create a very visible connection from one example to the next. Um, the, the um, uh, sorry, you guys, this is super clunky. Let's see. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Uh, I think I'm back. Um, uh, it's interesting to see how sometimes, uh, you know, even in internal reviews, and we say how, you know, some differences are okay, but as long as the work sort of hangs together, uh, uh, you know, then, then it's fine. I honestly don't even know if, if I could say this about this particular execution, but I also think that that wasn't even the point. They didn't even, they probably didn't even try to make a hand together they really wanted to create something that was a very eclectic, very um, uh, uh, kind of kaleidoscopic uh, 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 approach to a brand identity system. Um, so let's get going. There's another one that, it's, that I'm sure you guys can relate it to, minimalism. Uh, people that know me well uh, and that have worked with me uh, have certainly heard me saying at some point, sort of half joking that there's a, there's a little Swiss designer that lives inside of me. And um, what I mean by this is that uh, for decades, 
uh, I've been thinking about good design as a subtracted process, a process in which uh, a project was really not finished until also the last element that was not 200% necessary to support the communication was taken out of my work. Um, and so I ended up creating things that were really super streamlined and, and really only the essential was there. But I think it's, I think it's fair to say that that Swiss designer must be in some sort of irreversible coma uh, or at least to sound asleep because I really started to develop almost a form of rejection for clean and minimalistic design, uh, at least when it's done just for the sake of being clean and minimalistic. Um, I think it's a style that it's not, if it's not connected to a higher order, to a higher purpose, it can really and very easily become uninteresting and uh, incredibly predictable at the end of the day. Uh, while on the other hand, uh, stuff that years ago I would have immediately labeled as corny uh, really started to grow on me in a, in, in a very interesting way. Um, so this is going to be uh, maybe a little controversial, but I am going to share my screen again and show you uh, what I mean by that. Um, okay, okay, there you go. Um, so this is a this is an organic wine from France uh, that and these guys decided to take a completely different approach to uh, wine label design. It has absolutely nothing that communicates or that has cherries on it. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it has uh, kind, of a, kind of an intention to communicate an easier approach, something that is not as pretentious as the world of wine can be sometimes. Uh, and, it's just, and it's just interesting to me. It's just something that I have not seen before. Um, typography, this is a very old example here, but typography that it's uh, over elaborated uh, just for bubble gum uh, and 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 it's and it's just and it's just so interesting. Beer that doesn't have to look like beer, that doesn't have to look manly in order to be relevant. And how fun is that? Um, and typography that it's more airy and it's not and it's not done in you know rigorous inscripted in a rigorous grid of some kind. And even the the beautiful kind of roughness. Uh, this is from my last trip to Mexico. Some of the roughness of the signs that I have seen in there in chicken restaurants, which I found incredibly inspiring. And there's really nothing minimalistic about it. It's, 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 uh, it's handmade. Uh, it's completely uh, uh, rough in the execution. But even when you look at industry that are, that are more established, like you know, Mark Jacobs here, and one of, this is one of his last um, uh, uh, lines that just released, there's a roughness into it that I find incredibly fascinating. And, and of course, our friends at Trader Joe's that, you know, made perkiness, you know, they're, they're kind of their, their signature uh, and really have a way of, uh, sh uh, uh, of displaying their work uh, in a way that uh, it's quite unique and really, really makes um, uh, their product uh, stand out. Um, and so th the point here is that when design's uh, only purpose is to communicate an emotion that the viewer can relate to, style is not, uh, uh, is not the reason, it's not the driver, it's just a consequence. You arrive to a style because you're trying to establish a communication with the viewer. Um, the, the advertising pioneers in the 20s uh, created some amazing visual masterpiece that uh, uh, I, think, I think display this concept uh, in, a, in a very clear way. Uh, maybe it's because it was the early days, maybe it's because <clears throat> there was some sort of uh, innocence in the way that these things were created, but um, uh, it was an absolute, um, Share my screen again. Okay, um, it was uh, it was uh, absolutely fascinating. It is absolutely fascinating to me to see how uh, uh, how uh, simple the communication becomes when you want to show things like the elegance or the lightness of a of a bicycle, like in this case, or the the speed of a sport car. Um, 
uh, the quality of the ingredient uh, ingredients in a wine or the flavor in a in a uh, in a can of uh, of, of vegetables, uh, the benefit of using a certain product. Uh, the communication is just streamlined, stripped down to the essential in a beautiful way. And in many instances, almost all of these don't even need to say anything. I'm sorry for the copywriters that are uh, listening to this, and that this is this is absolutely not to diminish your work, but it's it's in, in, it's absolutely impressive to me that there's no need for words other than uh, the name of the product here, um, and uh, and. And so this is an interesting one. This is, this is something that I wanted to include because it's an old Italian ad uh, uh, for this motorcycle. And uh, the headline up here basically says that you can buy this, this, this motorcycle with blind faith. Uh, and I wanted to include it because it's, it's so innocent. Imagine proposing something like this today. And I can only imagine the conversations with the legal team. But anyway, um, you, you, you kind of get the idea here. I think it's, uh, it's uh, something that, um, uh, again, the pioneers of, of advertising in those early years um, uh, have done in a really, really, uh, uh, really beautiful way. Um, uh, let's see here. So there, there are some really, really good examples uh, along these lines in the field of industrial design. I, I, I have I had to confess that I have a fixation with industrial design. I, I use it as a as a source of inspiration all the time, and um, and it's interesting to notice how breakthrough innovation in the field of industrial design or product design, however you want to call it, um, often stems out of uh, from having access uh, uh, to new manufacturing processes or to new materials, um, something that can make the production at scale more feasible. And I believe it's the reason why for a very long time uh, in product design uh, function has always followed the form. Um, I, I, maybe that's not the case anymore. Probably not since this unstop unstoppable use of, of brass in furniture and home decor exploded. Uh, speaking of pandemics, and I really wish there was a vaccine for that, but, but you, 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 you understand what I mean by this. And a great example of what I'm talking about here is the work of the, um, the Finnish architect and designer, Alvar Aalto. Alvar Aalto, in the, uh, in the 1930s, uh, he perfected a technique to bend laminated wood, essentially plywood, at scale, uh, giving birth to uh, what it's called the L-shaped leg. Uh, the L-shaped leg became the cornerstone cornerstone of his entire production of furniture. Let me show you some examples of that. Um, uh, okay. So um, this, is, this was happening, what, 50 years before IKEA. Uh, Alfred Alto was now trying to establish a new style. He was trying to scale production of furniture uh, from being an artisanal activity to an industrial activity, at least as industrial as it could be uh, in, that, in that time. But um, the perfection in this uh, technique and this manufacturing process uh, started obviously to trickle into the final products and uh, a style all of a sudden was established which is completely unmistakable. He wasn't trying to do anything uh, with, uh, 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 you know, curved uh, wood that would look like that would look like this. It's by simply by curving the wood. This was this was the result of it, and it's something that has been presented consistently uh, in all of his in all of his work. Um, industrial design, in general, uh, uh, sorry. I'm back on screen here. Industrial design in general is um, something that uh, has seen some, some really interesting breakthrough, especially uh, over the 60s and 70s when uh, technology, the electronic, the uh, sort of the miniaturization of electronic components has started to get smaller and smaller. And there are some very interesting examples that I want to share with you. Some of them are very, uh, very famous and they 
um, uh, had a huge comeback in the last uh, maybe 10 or 12 years. Uh, some, are le some are less known, but um, uh, oh, let's see here. The, um, sorry guys, this is super clunky. I, I hate it. Uh, that's what we do these days, right? Okay. Telephone. Telephone is an interesting, very interesting category. Uh, 1966. This is this is the telephone I grew up with, and it had it had its place in uh, a central part of the of the house where I lived, and um, uh, it was in the entryway, and it was the only telephone in the house. Uh, in the same year, Italtel uh, launched this this uh, telephone called Brillo, which means cricket in Italian. And it's a, I believe it's the, really the first flip phone that was ever created. And the reason why this is important is because they were able to contain the same identical function of the previous one in less than half the space. Uh, that was only possible because the technology, this was an electromechanical phone. This is an almost completely digitalized phone for what digital was at the time. Uh, but the consequence of that is that all of a sudden telephones started to appear uh, on nightstands uh, in other parts of the house, in kitchens, because you didn't need that much room in order to have another one and really change the use of it completely. Um, this is another great example. In the 19, 1940s, this is what a telephone looked like. And in the same years, uh, Ericsson in Sweden started to develop this idea of a unit body uh, containing the same identical function of, of this one to the left into one single unit. Uh, and then in, in the mid 50s, they started production of what it's, it became famous as the Eureka phone, which is exactly what you see in the picture here. Uh, again, in the 60s, this is what a portable radio would look like. But again, because of the advancement of technology and the miniaturization of the electronic components, Brian Vega uh, and designer Richard Sapper and Marco Zanuzzo, they created this unbelievable radio, which, is, which closes like a book. It's hinged to the, to the, to the back here. Uh, one side contains the speaker, the other side, contain, the other side contains the, the radio itself. And this element up here is a retractable handle that you can use to carry the, the, the radio with you. Um, uh, this is a very famous chair. It's the Panton chair. Uh, the designer, Werner Panton, designed this in the 60s uh, at the time where regular chairs looked pretty much like this. They were normally made of wood or metal. Uh, there was no intent to create a, a, a chair that was shaped like this, but this is the first chair that was created out of an injection mold uh, at scale, industrially produced. And uh, it's a single component. And if you look to the one to the left here, you, 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 you know that there's certainly more than one element in there. And so again, the style, the style uh, uh, was the, the consequence of the industrial production, was the, of the intent, of the initial intent of the design. Um, this is another really good example, uh, mid-60s again, um, mid-60s, um, normal table uh, clocks look like this. Uh, with them. This is beautiful, by the way. This is no criticism to uh, Jungans. This is a really nice piece. But during the same time, at the same time, Solari, created uh, and perfected the uh, electromechanical uh, engineering for digital reading. And all of a sudden, arms and clocks were no longer needed. And, uh, and so this clock came to life and it has a million different incarnations. The interesting part is that the reason why this, the clock is shaped like this, this sort of a cylindrical element, it's not because they wanted to create a cylindrical, but it's simply because the mechanism inside has this rotating movement that can only be allowed by a cylindrical element. And therefore, the shape was born. Um, and then lastly, uh, this is one of my favorites. This is what a typical car in the mid 50s in Europe would look like. Also beautiful, by the way. But uh, 1950s, 1956, uh, French automaker Citroën, they created this <clears throat> absolute masterpiece. And it's a car that revolutionized the auto industry. I think the only parallel to that nowadays is probably the Tesla Model S and how disruptive it has been. But this is, this is 60, 70 years before that. Um, the cool part about this car is that 
in addition to being an unbelievable shape, uh, very low aerodynamics for that, for that era, um, the car is built with two parallel beams, beams uh, uh, and a transversal one, almost like in an H shape, and each element of the car is bolted to it. So there's no bearing responsibility for any of the elements, including the roof on the car. Um, and the reason why it's because all of the car is, uh, is managed by a hydraulic system that regulates the suspensions, which is a vital, obviously a vital uh, function for the car, uh, the steering wheel, the brakes, and all of a sudden, uh, there was no need to have many of the elements that you would normally have in automotive design, and which allowed uh, for this design to come to life uh, this way. Anyway, um, let me let me come back on screen here. I I um, I hope that this was uh, that this was. Uh, kind of a, a, a clear enough uh, way to represent uh, my point of view here. Again, not, not again in the, in the, with the intent of uh, teaching anyone. It's, it's really, you know, what's going on through my head these days and um, kind of the journey, that I, the journey that I am having as a, uh, as, a, as a graphic designer, as a brand designer. And um, this, this kind of brings me to the, uh, to the final uh, part of this of this presentation, and um, I want to leave you with one thought, though. Um, the reason that brought me to spend time on this topic and the research that I've done to put this presentation together uh, led me to believe that true innovation only happens when creativity is free from the constraints of style, uh, and it's something that I want to remember uh, more from now on when I approach my projects and. If we don't get preoccupied with feeding into a certain box, I believe that we can do incredibly, <coughs> incredibly cool things. All right, that's all my friends. I hope you enjoy uh, this, uh, what, 30 minutes together. Uh, from my perspective, uh, if I was able to inspire some thinking uh, and maybe trigger uh, some new thinking the, at the next time you approach a project, I will call that a success. I wanna thank you again. Uh, and I'm going to pass the microphone back to you. If there are questions, I'm happy to happy to take them. Yes, we've got lots of questions. There's a few hundred people online at the moment, and uh, what an amazing presentation! I'm getting loads of messages saying how cool this is, and and thank you so much for your time. So let's jump into the first question. Um, it's from a Roy Leon. What do you feel about tactile packaging as branding products are sold more online? Um, very good question. Uh, honestly, you know, this is, this may sound odd for some of the works, uh, at Amazon, but, um, the, the channel, the digital channel is kind of irrelevant to me. It's a mean to an end at the end of the day, whether you buy a product, uh, in a store, you buy a product online, it's going to end up in your hands. Uh, in your home, in your bathroom, in your kitchen, in your wherever you, you're going to use it. And so all senses are going to be involved. Uh, visual, tactile, uh, a sense of smell. Uh, these are the sound. These are all super important elements that, in my view, completely transcend from how you, how you acquire the, 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 the product. And so tactile design is incredibly important. Uh, I could spend a whole lot of time to talk about uh, something that we've been uh, discussing even in recent days uh, in my team about the use of matte finishes versus shiny finishes. There's a tactile component into that. I have my own point of view on that, but I'm not gonna go into that level of detail. Let's just say that it's super important. I believe that it's super important. Okay, great, great. Uh, we've got one from social media. What was one of your most recent and favorite packaging projects that you have worked on personally? Uh, well, I, I don't design that much anymore, unfortunately, or luckily, depends on how you want to look at it. Uh, and so I can only speak, if I want to look at something uh, recent, I can only speak to some of the most recent projects that I have worked on. Um, we have a, a 
funny enough, one of the one of the projects that I uh, one of my projects that I love the most uh, is probably the most undesigned uh, uh, project that I have ever worked on. Uh, we have a line of products uh, that sells on Amazon called Solimo. Um, Solimo is a, uh, the name came about because Solimo is one of the um, tributary rivers in South America uh, of the Amazon River. So there's a kind of a brand connection there. The actual name is Solimosh, but we shorted it in Solimo. And the, the main goal for that line was to uh, create a system that we could apply very easily, very quickly to any kind of products that we could think of. Uh, working directly with our suppliers and uh, essentially make it as plug and play as possible. So the result of it, when you buy that product is, you may easily say, I say that it's underwhelming all the time because it is from a purely from a design standpoint, but I do believe that it's nothing short of genius and I'm not patting myself here. I'm, I, I'm, I was part of a <clears throat> very capable team that worked on it, <clears throat> but I think it's really genius in the way that it has provided a way to execute packaging uh, outside of my own team, basically all around the world uh, for anyone that wants to produce uh, products under that brand. So the flexibility of it, I, I guess, is the part that I find fascinating. Great, great. We've got uh, a couple more we're gonna try and get through. Um, Catherine has got a question. Um, what advice would you give to a new designer entering the creative industry um, being passionate to create fun design, how do we keep uh, experimental design in the main line of work? Uh, it's exactly what you said. Yeah. You do it. Uh, you just do it. You know, you don't, you have to, sometimes it's not easy and sometimes you don't have the time and sometimes you're, 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 you're uh, overwhelmed by uh, the request from your customer, your boss, your whomever that is, you have to protect, protect your time, your creative space as uh, uh, something that is vital to your success. Uh, it's quintessential to your success. And so um, it may be more of an effort at the beginning of your career. Uh, I don't know, I think everyone, maybe it's different that way, uh, but it's something that you absolutely have to do. It's a conscious effort that you have to uh, dedicate and protect time for. Great, great. You've been um, an incredible keynote speaker today. Um, everyone's going crazy on the socials and, and <laughs> online right now, and it's a shame we can't get through any more questions. So can we give Danny a, a round of applause and say thank you for his great presentation here? Thank you, my friend. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, um, that's the end of the second day of our Pentawalls Festival. Um, I want to thank all of the speakers, my team, and of course, all of you watching at home and in your offices. Um, thank you for your questions, for your comments, for sharing. Um, you can continue the conversation on our social channels using the hashtag Pencils Festival. Um, all these presentations will be available on demand. Um, we'll be back tomorrow for the final day of our festival. Um, catch us at 1 p.m. BST. Uh, we'll be live in a studio in London to bring you the official Pentwoods Gala Ceremony 2020. And I am so excited. Tune in to find out who will be the designer of the year, design agency of the year, and who will win best of show winner and who else will get their hands on a trophy. Um, I want to finish by just saying, uh, you know, this has been an amazing opportunity to connect with everyone. Um, as I sit here looking a bit like a weatherman, predicting the weather behind me. Um, one thing I'm going to say, the, the future is going to be bright. We are going to get through these times. Um, please stay strong. Um, thank you for, for being here with us. We will continue to promote packaging design and to connect with our community. Um, my name's Adam Ryan. I am Head of Pentwood. You've been watching the Pentwood Festival. Good night, good evening, stay safe. And one more time for Danielle Monty. Thank you. Take care.